Anyone counting down? Yeah, yeah two John Dory. Three minutes to the window. Two yeah. John Dory, one salmon, two chicken. Okay, let's go. Come on. Going up by the pass with the chicken patrols up. Bobby, is, this right gonna be, is it going to be the first completed table? Yeah. Yes, the jobs report is out. August non-farm payrolls increase a minuscule 235,000. 235,000, you heard me right. Hi, was your best service? Oh, yes, no. excellent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> Tonight was extraordinary. Yes, really well done. Thanks. hourly earnings zoom 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 boy you can go back in history there's not a lot of up six tenths of one percent month over month up 4.3 on earnings year over year burn you're cooking in a burnt pan you fucking dick oh my god leave it leave it leave it just fucking leave it you're gonna blow fire in your face you fucking donkey All right, today is Monday, September 6th. And oh, what a beautiful weekend we're having right now. Happy Labor Day, you bums. You get to enjoy the sunshine, the family, the barbecues. You relax, you recharge, and you wake up tomorrow so you can work harder for Jeff Bezos. Meanwhile, it's Labor Day every day for Jeff Bezos. He gets to relax, do nothing at all, sit in his ass, and watch his wealth increase by the day, by the minute, as the Fed continues to grease up the market with funny money that magically flows into the equities market, pushing the value of Amazon stock higher. And Jeff Bezos gets to dump a bunch of stocks, ta-da, and the guy becomes a billionaire. It's really money laundering when you think about it. The only difference is fake money gets washed and it becomes real money. Yeah, a little creepy. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we continue to advocate for you guys to participate in the stock market in an intelligent, disciplined, and rational way because this is the only way you're going to make money in this economy. Anyhow, we got a lot to talk about. And I got a good one for you tonight, as I do every single night. But this time around, we're going to talk about the jobs report, the phony jobs report that we got on Friday. The headline number, as you might be aware by now, is 235,000 jobs added. Now, in a normal year, this is a good number, but the expectations were for about 720 thousand jobs so this is a mess of epic proportions this is the most horrific number that could ever happen and come out of the bls regarding the jobs creation regarding the so-called economic recovery that's going on in the economy right now and by the way the cooks gave us 235,000, which is about rare not even medium rare this is rare which makes it very very excellent for the stock market why because bad news is fantastic news for the market it means that the fed will continue to print baby print with no end in sight but this time around the cooks have no shame at all at this point i trust the ccp number the chinese communist party's numbers over the u.s government's numbers for example a couple of days before we got the bls non-farm payroll report we got the private payroll report from the ADP. The private sector of the economy in the month of August created 374,000 jobs. But magically, the cooks at the BLS gave us 235,000 jobs. In other words, did the private sector of the economy create more jobs than the private and public sectors combined? This is exactly what they're saying. And again, it gets even more laughable as we get to the details. 
For example, take a look at these numbers. According to the ADP report, for the private sector only, we have created 9,000 jobs in resources and mining, 6,000 jobs in manufacturing, 30,000 jobs in construction. And when it comes to services, 18,000 jobs were created in transportation and utilities, 59,000 jobs in education, healthcare. But perhaps the most important number is for leisure and hospitality, which created 201,000 jobs in the month of August, according to the ADP report. But this is what we got from the Cooks at the BLS. Magically, leisure and hospitality created zero jobs. Not one, not two, not minus three, zero. Exactly zero. Again, they have no shame at this point. They're cooking the data to fit the narrative. And the narrative is, we need a weak jobs report so we could continue to justify the printing, aka cocaine operation from the Fed of greasing up the equities and real estate markets. And perhaps what's even more surprising is the fact that the government lost jobs in August. Matter of fact, lost 8,000 jobs. Does anybody believe this garbage? Of course not. Unless you have your head up your ass, and that's absolutely okay right now. These days, pretty much about 70 to 80% of the population have their heads stuck deep, deep in their asses. You're not alone. And the take is, this uh, rare jobs report, this weak, abysmal jobs report, will allow the Fed to delay tapering. So no tapering in September. Not going to be announced. Why? Because we need more accommodation. We need more coke from the Fed. Otherwise, the economy will crash. We need more coke so we can create more jobs. But I will show you that this narrative is absolute garbage in a second. But for now, the Fed has the perfect excuse to delay tapering for as long as possible because substantial further progress, remember that one, has not been met when it comes to employment. What is substantial further progress, Mr. Powell? I don't know. It could be a lot of other things. We're looking at many other things when it comes to substantial further progress. It's extremely flexible and we have to stay vague as much as we can. When you look at the unemployment rate, the civilian unemployment rate, every single demographic Every single one has yet to recover the pre-pandemic numbers. Whether we're talking about whites, blacks, agents, Hispanics, men, women, all shades in the ice cream shop, none of them have recovered the pre-pandemic numbers. With exception, of course, of uh, teenagers, 16 to 19 years old. But even with this demographic, we're seeing numbers perking up higher once again. The unemployment rate within teenagers is increasing once again. Why? If you are between the ages of 16 and 19, please tell me, does it make sense at all, at all, for you to work in McDonald's these days? For a shitty minimum wage? Of course not. What makes sense is you go to your parents' home, you stay rent-free, okay, you pick up the garbage and uh, you cut some grass, that's okay. In the meantime, you're sitting on your ass playing video games and you're making money off Twitch. Now, when we look at the duration of unemployment, the majority of those unemployed have been unemployed for over 27 weeks. But yes, one more month, a few more months of printing $120 billion, a minimum, in buying bonds, a mortgage-backed securities, magically somehow will recover those jobs and those unemployed who have been unemployed for over 27 weeks. What a joke. And of course, Biden came out and said, you know what? This number was disappointing. We're looking for a larger number. Wink, wink. And we could blame the Delta variant and the uncertainty regarding COVID for the abysmal jobs report, which we don't like, by the way. Did we say that? We don't like this jobs report. You sure, Joe, that you don't like this jobs report? It's a little too weak for you? Or is this the best thing that ever happened to you? Because for now, the Fed has the excuse to continue to print funny money out of thin air, billions and billions and billions of dollars every single month. And you can use those billions and billions and billions of dollars, Mr. Joe Biden, to buy voters with more stimulus and more programs, etc., etc., etc. But there is one problem here, folks. One major, underline major, massive error that the cooks at the BLS committed Friday morning, September 3rd. They forgot to cook the wage inflation number. The wage inflation number came out as one of the hottest increases in wages in decades. 
So on one hand, the Fed has an excuse to delay tapering because we have a weak jobs report. On the other hand, inflation is rising like crazy. The cooks forgot to take care of the most important element here. So we have a battlefield between will the Fed taper because the increase in wage inflation, and we know that Wall Street and the 1% will tolerate inflation. They have no problem with equities market inflation or real estate market inflation. But when it comes to your wages, uh, 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 God forbid the bums make a little more. We have to end the party right now. On the other hand, the weak jobs report, the headline number, allows the Fed for more, shall we say, flexibility in their tapering outlook. And here's the problem. Wages are surging higher, surging across every sector of the economy, which is, yes, good news for the bum class that they're making more right now. But the catch is for every dollar you make in extra wages, you're going to pay two more in rent because rents are surging higher. Hold that thought. For now, let's talk about this. These are the different sectors of the economy. The x-axis represent the increase month over month in employment in each of these sectors. Meanwhile, the y-axis represent the average hourly earnings in that particular sector. For example, the average is 30 bucks, about 31 bucks. That's the average wage hourly wage across the economy and as you can see retail trade lost jobs month over months and this was expected by the way because of delta we already talked about that meanwhile professional and business services created the most jobs in the month of august now let's look at the hourly wage for some of these sectors for example in retail trade this is the sector of the economy that lost jobs in the month of August. The average hourly earning is around 22 bucks. Okay, here is uh, leisure and hospitality, about 19 bucks an hour. Meanwhile, the sector of the economy that gained the most jobs in August, professional and business services, the average hourly earning is around 37 bucks an hour. Now, the highest hourly wages come out of the utilities sector of the economy at around 45 bucks an hour. Now, utilities tend to be more stable, not just in the economy, but also in the market. And therefore, utilities are considered defensives. And that is for a reason. Utilities tend to have less fluctuation in the economy and the market, by the way. For example, you're going to have to pay your utilities bills regardless whether you have a job or you don't have a job, whether we have a good economy or a bad economy, whether we have lockdowns or no lockdowns, you still have to pay your utilities bills. And therefore, we don't see massive gains or massive losses in jobs in this sector. Likewise, utilities are described as defensive in the stock market, for example, or even an alternative for treasury yields, which makes utilities more stable as an investment. Why? The cash flow is predictable. There is less and less fluctuation in this particular sector of the economy. And therefore, the dividend yield from utilities is reliable. And you're not going to have times when utilities companies cut their dividends, say as in oil companies, and therefore utilities are defensive in nature. But when it comes to wages, the moral of the story here, wages are rising higher for multiple reasons. We have the labor shortage. We also have workers working more hours. So before you celebrate any wage gains for workers in this country, understand that we have the hardest working population in any modern nation. We are overworked and underpaid all in all. And of course... There will not be any end in sight here for the rise in wages and wage inflation in general. And the reason is you have businesses, the likes of Under Armour, who are finding out that once you hike wages, you don't have difficulties with labor shortages. You're going to have people applying left and right. And that brings me to the point of me supporting the minimum wage. In the past, when I voiced my opinion of supporting the minimum wage, I got attacked by these uh, libertarians. Bro, you don't understand the minimum wage is a job killer and uh, big government. That's not acceptable. You have to listen to this economist back from the 70s, yada, yada, yada. Meanwhile, you geniuses, maybe you have to listen to me for a while here. The beauty of the minimum wage Number one, it establishes a floor. You cannot pay workers less than this rate. Number two, it establishes a psychological ceiling 
of how much you're going to pay workers at the lower end of the wage spectrum. Meaning when we have inflation as we're having right now, the minimum wage is far below what workers consider as a fair wage, considering all of this inflation that's going on around us. Without a clear guideline from the government, what the minimum wage is, we find ourselves in a bidding war, not from workers, but from employers. Amazon raises the minimum wage to 15 bucks an hour. Now, Walmart has to respond and compete with Amazon for workers in this inflationary environment. So Walmart responds by hiking up wages to 16 bucks an hour. Next thing you know, Target is now hiking up wages to 18 bucks an hour, and it becomes a bidding war. Amazon has to respond now, and Amazon has endless pockets. Amazon raises the minimum wage to 20 bucks an hour. Walmart has to respond. They raise it to 22 bucks an hour, and this will unleash a spiral of wage increases, and by the end of this inflation, the minimum wage is now at 25 bucks an hour. What does that do? It pretty much destroys small businesses because while Amazon, Walmart, and Target, they can compete and fight each other, bidding the minimum wage higher and higher and higher, but small businesses cannot do that at all. So do you understand the beauty of the minimum wage right now, libertarians, librarians, whatever the hell you are? Because I can tell you from a personal experience, I went to a shop a postal shop, they do notary and other services, passports, etc. And the owner of the shop was working that day. So I asked him, why are you working in your own shop? And he answers, well, I cannot find any workers. There are no workers. You got to pay them 20 bucks an hour to work in this shop. So I have to work on my own. Oh, and by the way, we're losing money to the big guys, the FedEx, the UPS of the world, Amazon, etc. Add to that, we're not having any help here. The last help we got from the PPP loans program last year, and that's already over. On top of that, we have credit cards. All of you guys want to pay with credit cards. We have credit card companies charging excessive fees. At what point do you just close shop? At what point do you just give up? on your small business. Once again, folks, small businesses will become extinct species in this country. They're playing with both hands tied behind their backs. And by the way, what is this called when you have a bad jobs number, but wages are rising higher? This is called, and we can say it out loud right now because everybody else is saying it, stagflation. In this channel, we've been ahead of the curve in calling stagflation. And now everybody and their mothers are calling for stagflation. Bank of America is now warning of upcoming stagflation risk. The Hill says the return of stagflation and the misery index. Those were some bad days. Even the Wall Street Journal, your favorite propaganda machine, is now talking about stagflation. And here we have Barron's. And they say a weak jobs report puts the Fed in a bind as it stares at, say it with me, stagflation. Real Money says, embrace stagflation in your portfolio. Reuters says, stagflation trades boom as investors flee U.S. debt. And of course, if you want to see stagflation, look no further than the country of Brazil. Fear of stagflation increases significantly in Brazil. And here is from Bloomberg allowing uh, Di Martino Booth to talk about stagflation now. And she warns there is a toxic brew of stagflation on the rise that will be difficult for central bankers to address going forward. And all of this, by the way, was predicted by the guy you're listening to right now. When we got the last jobs report for July, this is what I tweeted. Today's blockbuster jobs report, medium well to well done, is an indicator that the pace of economic recovery and inflation is still intact. My prediction is this report is the peak. We will see less jobs created in the next few months while inflation continues to rise. The Fed will realize in the next few months that their printing policy was not behind recovering all of these jobs, but it was the reopening of the economy instead. In fact, by that point, signs of stagflation will become more evident if the Fed doesn't start tapering now. And this is exactly what's happening. Stagflation is on the rise with no stop in sight at all. Why? Because while used cars prices might go down, and as Delta, the rise of Delta, will put a dent 
on airfares, hotels, and rental car prices, we continue to see the sleeping giant shelter inflation, specifically rents, rising in an extremely alarming rate. Landlords across the country are hiking rents like never before. And we continue to hear from geniuses that the evictions moratorium, the expiration of the evictions moratorium, will add more supply to the market and rents will go down. False. Absolute garbage. Landlords are raising rents because they're bringing up the value of their property to market value. And they're not going to have any hard time finding new tenants who are willing to pay the extra rent. No problem at all. If anything, from the tenant side, from those who are seeking to buy homes, there is nothing to buy, nothing to rent. There is a supply problem and there is an affordability problem. The difference is landlords will continue to hike up wages so long as there is appeal to rent these properties at a higher rate. And this will continue to happen because we have homeowners, potential homeowners, who are not going to find homes at all. Why? The majority of homes were already scooped up by the rich and corporations because they want to be landlords. They stole the homes from the average American who is looking to buy a home. There are no homes to buy. There are only homes to rent. So you have no choice at all but to pay the extra rent. And therefore, rents will continue to surge higher. In the meantime, by the time supply arrives to the housing market, it will be too late. And when supply arrives, the housing market will crash. But this is far away from where we are right now in the economy. Of course, the Fed can prematurely crash the housing market via tapering MBS purchases. But that's also far away from where we are right now. And the reason is we got a weak, quote-unquote weak, jobs number, which will permit the Fed to continue printing. And this leads me to the moral of the story. Will printing save the economy? Is printing needed to continue to recover the economy and create more jobs? Or is printing not working at all and the only byproduct of printing is inflation and creating asset bubbles in the equities and real estate markets? Central banks across the world ushered the tsunami of liquidity to battle the COVID-19 virus. Trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. But the truth is, the civilian labor force participation rate is at the lowest it has ever been in history, regardless of the printing. The employment to population ratio is also at the lowest level in decades, regardless of of the printing. Those who've been unemployed for over 27 weeks, that level is now pretty much on par at the height of the financial crisis in the aftermath of 2008 and 2009. So looking at this number alone, unemployed workers who've been unemployed for 27 weeks or longer, this economy is in a recession regardless of the printing. And perhaps this is the most solid evidence of all. This is from the BLS, the payroll employment change. We've been adding jobs in September of last year, October, and then we started to see a dip in November, December, and January before recovering once again in February and March. And then we saw another dip in April before recovering once again in June, July, and now we have a massive dip in August. Did anything change here when these dips happened? For example, did the Fed forget to print in November, December, and January? Did the Fed forget to print in April and last month in August? Not at all. The Fed continues to print on autopilot $120 billion minimum a month. So the printing has been constant while payroll numbers fluctuate up and down. Is there a correlation between printing, aka the cocaine operation, and jobs creation, or is there a correlation between jobs creation and the virus? And as you can see, in November, December, all the way to January, we had a spike, a massive one, in COVID cases. Likewise, that dip that you saw in April in jobs, that coincided with a spike in COVID cases in April. And now that we're seeing a spike in August due to the Delta variant, we're seeing jobs creation also taking a dip. 
So once again, the Mr. Powell, Mr. Kashkari, all of the Fed zombies out there, is there any correlation between jobs creation and printing, or is the correlation of jobs creation actually with the cases of the virus? When cases go down, we see more hiring. When cases go higher, we see less hiring. Therefore, the printing is not needed, and tapering should happen right now, before it's too late, because the only byproduct of printing Quantitative easing at this point, aka the cocaine operation, the only byproduct of that operation is higher inflation and a bigger bubble in the equities and real estate markets. And of course, everybody's looking for the direction ahead for the market. Will the market go with the narrative that the Fed is not going to taper? and therefore equities will continue to surge higher or will the market buy the wage inflation narrative and therefore anticipate an earlier taper from Powell and company and therefore we see the equities market crashing which one is it i will let Powell himself answer this question and here he is that brings me to a concluding word on the path ahead for monetary policy the committee remains steadfast in our oft-expressed commitment to support the economy for as long as is needed to achieve a full recovery. The changes we made last year to our monetary policy framework are well suited to address today's challenges. We have said that we would continue our asset purchases at the current pace until we see substantial further progress toward our maximum employment and price stability goals measured since last December when we first articulated this guidance. <clears throat> My view is that the substantial further progress test has been met for inflation. There has also been clear progress toward maximum employment. At the FOMC's recent July meeting, I was of the view, as were most participants, that if the economy evolved broadly as anticipated, it could be appropriate to start reducing the pace of asset purchases this year. The intervening month, has brought more progress in the form of a strong employment report for July, but also the further spread of the Delta variant. We will be carefully assessing incoming data and the evolving risks. So Powell says, we have already met our 2% target when it comes to tapering in inflation. So we're not looking at inflation anymore. Oh, and by the way, inflation will be transitory. Rest assured trust us we're actually looking at further substa or substantial further progress in employment and Powell says with the rise of delta the likelihood is we're gonna get slower and weaker jobs reports which will once again delay tapering so Powell himself says we're not gonna taper that's the conclusion what does that mean stonks to all Tom Heights will we ever get to a point where bad news is bad news that could happen but until that day your assumption has to be tapering will be delayed and the equities market will surge higher i'm not saying it's an easy call it's a tough one because this inflation is not used cars it's not airfares, it's not hotels, it's not food and energy which the Fed could care less about. This inflation is in wages and Wall Street and the 1% dislike more than anything wage inflation. So we will continue to monitor how the market reacts in the next few days, specifically watching the US dollar because if the dollar does a 180 and it starts to surge once again, then the market is actually anticipating tapering. But if the dollar continues to ease then the market is going with the narrative that Powell will not taper and if anything this jobs report that we got will be more fuel to the fire for Powell to continue to hold on on tapering regardless of the opposition the internal opposition that Powell is facing from his colleagues all right let's move on to charts I got a special one for you tonight because we will go over meme stocks. Yep, your favorite. But let's start with the SPY 30 minutes chart. Anything new here? Not at all. And the reason is the market has no reason at all to sell right now. There is no reason to sell. Is there a reason to buy? Not really. The stock market is already at all time highs. The valuations are crazy. Corporate earnings already behind us. So there is no catalyst for the market to move up high higher beside the per usual grind up higher autopilot buying why because the fed has not changed policy yet 
and until the Fed changes policy, the market will continue to grind its way higher. But in conditions like these, when the market has no reason to sell, but also no reason to buy, any bad news, specifically out of the blue bad news, will cause the market to flush down. And if that happens, the SPY will go down to at least the support of 447. That's nothing, but it's a start if we get out of the blue bad news that will flush the market to the downside. In addition, if the Fed looks at wage inflation and says, you know what, we're going to start tapering anyways, that will be the ultimate bad news for the market. But for now, the assumption is the market will continue to grind its way higher. This is a 30 minutes chart for the SPY, the S&P 500, but this time we're talking about the futures contract. We had a resistance at 4,540. The chart attempted multiple times over and over and over again to break above that level. This is bullish behavior indicating that the break higher will happen sooner or later. On Friday, we got the break higher. Is this bullish or is this bearish? The answer is it is bullish. And once again, this is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the S&P 500. We're tracking the divergence from the trend line. And again, we're at around 3.22%. This is normal. It's average. So if this is a garden variety divergence from the trend line, the SPY should start to pull down right now. But if this is the last hurrah rally, as I am anticipating, then the divergence will go a little higher, perhaps to 5%, before this trend is broken once and for all. What's going on with the queues? 30 minutes chart, nothing at all, still trading within range. Any reason to sell? Not at all. Any reason to buy? Not at all. And in this environment, the market will grind its way higher. Market participants will find holes to fill. For example, you have a lot of tech stocks already trading at all-time highs. But there are, are other stocks, for example, Netflix, which has been consolidating for over a year within a range. Netflix is starting to break out of the consolidation range and it's breaking up higher. So there are spots here in the market for trades where you can buy, hold for a day or two, perhaps a week or two, and then close and book profits and move on to the next trade. This is not a healthy behavior for the market, by the way, when it acts like a headless chicken, yo-yoing back and forth between themes, the inflationary trade, the disinflationary trade, buying stocks for a short-term scope. These kind of divergences and behaviors usually indicate that we are closer to the end of the trend. This is a daily chart for the continuous contract on the NASDAQ. Again, we have a bull flag formation that is breaking out higher. Yes, the momentum indicators, the RSI and the MACD, all at elevated readings, but they could continue to go higher, and therefore, we call it the last hurrah Rally. This is a daily chart for the NDX, the big NASDAQ. And again, we are within the normal range of divergence, which is between about 10% to 15%. The problem with this uh, run, the latest run in the trend, is the fact that we went on and on and on without even a 5% correction like it happened before. And therefore, the expectations are that the pullback this time around will be more violent. How violent would it be? Here it is. Assume that we pull back from this point right now. The correction in the NASDAQ will be about 10%. And this is, by the way, normal. This is how the market behaves in normal times. Nothing wrong at all. If the NASDAQ goes down 10%, it is still within the trend line. This is a 30 minutes chart for the IWM. What's going on here? The support remains at 223. The resistance remains at 229. Is the chart behavior bullish or bearish? The answer is it is bullish. Why? Because the chart peaked its head above 229 for a little while, about an hour or so, and then it pulled down to gather more energy for the final breakout higher above 229. And if indeed the market reads the latest jobs report, as a green light for the Fed to delay tapering, then you bet that the IWM and the reopening trade will continue to gather momentum. What about the Dixie? What's going on here? It is catching support for now from 92, but the assumption is 
if the Fed is not going to taper, or at least announce tapering in September, then the dollar should go further down. But if the Fed is about to taper based on the wage inflation number, then the dollar should trade higher, bounces from 92, and perhaps recapturing 93 as support once again. For me, this is the most important chart to watch, because it has been accurate so far. No funny business whatsoever, but you have to remember this. We call it Tricky Dixie for a reason. This is gold. What's going on here? It is retracing, facing resistance at the level that we have expected resistance at, the Fibonacci retracement level at around 1830 now if the dollar is about to catch an oversold bounce from 92 for a day or two then the assumption is gold will also pull back but remember gold has two enemies so let's say the dixie bounces higher from 92 then you have yields and it appears that yields will continue to rise higher from this point on so yes gold had an excellent week last week but be careful here this is a point to book profits if you bought the dip in gold. This is the chart of the 10-year yield. Once again, the retest of 1.28% appears to be successful for now. And if that is the case, then we should assume that yields will continue to rise higher. Now, this is important, by the way. On Friday, I was watching CNBC, and the anchor, a tall girl, I think her name is Kelly, and she gets pregnant every three weeks. Hey, I'm back. Oh, wait, I got pregnant. Bye-bye. Anyhow, Kelly was saying yields are trading higher today, meaning Friday, due to the wage inflation number. That's false. And this is how misleading CNBC can be. In this channel, we have solved the bond market mystery it took us a little while, but we figured it out. Yields were trading higher under the assumption that inflation is rising higher. The problem started around May, in particular June, when Powell came out and hinted at tapering. Then yields went down, which doesn't make sense at all. The Fed has been buying at least 25% of the supply of bonds. It's the sugar daddy who's been propping up bond prices higher. If the sugar daddy is about to taper and buy less bonds, then the prices of bonds will go down and yields should surge higher. This is not what happened. Why? There is a rule in the stock market, in investing in general. Always trust the bond market. Always. When the bond market trades yields down as inflation continues to surge higher, and by the way, to, I don't know if Kelly was aware of that or not, but we've been getting the hottest inflation numbers in years. The PPI, the hottest number in over 30 years. The core PCE, the highest number since the 1970s. The core chiller index, the highest number on record. With all of that, yields have been trading down. So now the wage inflation is rising higher. Yields are trading higher. Come on. Yields traded down for a reason. When Powell hinted at tapering, the bond market was saying this is a zombified economy hooked up on steroids and drugs. If you remove the steroids and drugs, the economic growth story will flush down the toilet and therefore yields went down. But if Powell holds on tapering, then the story of economic growth and inflation is still intact and yields trade higher. It doesn't make sense, but this is how the, the bond market has been trading. There will come a time when the Fed actually tapers, and when that happens, yields will spike up higher. Of course, for now, this is a fantasy because the Fed continues to weasel its way around. We're not going to taper because substantial further progress on whatever, and they can, they're going to continue to kick the can down the road for as long as they can. But when they have to face the phenomena of inflation evolving into stagflation, they're going to have to taper and yields will pop higher. This is at least what investors the likes of uh, Burry, the big short, are betting on. Anyhow, this is the weekly chart of the TLT. The TLT is still trading within range, hugging the 149 number, which is extremely important, by the way. But the weekly candle not looking so good here. And if yields are indeed about to surge higher because tapering is not going to happen, allowing inflation to continue to rise a little higher, and therefore the economic growth story will also be allowed to continue. This will push yields to trade way above 1.28% and as a result it will push the TLT to flush down trading below 149 and therefore this leg in the rally in the TLT is over assuming that the market will behave in this way that I just described. Here is a chart of the VIX what's going on here. We have a mini 
peak, a little pop in the MACD indicator with green impressions in the histogram, but it's not powerful yet. It's not significant yet to assume anything. Remember that we have a gap at around 15. And if we're about to see a last hurrah rally in the market, then the VIX will trade down to close that gap. So I am watching on Monday how the VIX will behave. If this is just a mere peak, not a real pop in the MACD, then the assumption is the VIX will flush down to close the gap. But if this is the beginning of something and the VIX is about to shoot up higher, then remember the divergence in the SPY from the trend line is just another garden variety divergence. 30 minutes chart of Apple, what's going on here? Breaking up higher from the wedge consolidation, trading at all time highs. The sky is the limit right now. This is my leading indicator, if you remember. And if Apple is trading high, higher the market is just fine. The market will continue to trade higher. If Apple is shot, then we get a problem. But so long as Apple is trading higher, the market will do just fine. Watch for a break below 150. If that happens, we get a problem. Other than that, the sky is the limit for Apple right now. Tesla, what's going on here? 30 minutes chart. I've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the higher low to come. We have higher highs and we have higher lows. Is this the higher low for Tesla? And if it is, then the chart is bullish. But if this is not it, and this is a false, say, short covering on Friday or whatever, and the chart trades down starting tomorrow, breaking 720, then we get a problem. But even if that happens, the trend remains intact so long we have higher highs and higher lows. Tulips, what's going on here? finally breaking above 50,000, which was, and perhaps still is, a tough threshold to break above. But we have one catalyst here that is important in the crypto slash tulip market, which is ETH, Ethereum. Perhaps the tide lifting all boats, including the big brother, BTC. If the rally continues, we have more room to go here. And I'm looking at 53,200 53, as the next resistance. And speaking of the devil, here it is, ETH, breaking up higher and now all time highs becomes an easy target nobody's gonna sell here until we get to the double top formation ask yourself a question if you bought right now i mean you should be taking profits off the table that's what disciplined traders do but you're gonna let some ride here all the way to see how it acts around all time highs it's a target everybody's looking at it everybody's anticipating it and when that is the case it usually goes all the way closer to the all time highs and it pulls back before reaching all-time highs exactly why because traders already anticipating the move to all-time highs as the next resistance level as the double top so they start taking profits before that happened and you see the chart pulling back before reaching all-time highs let's move on to meme stocks and see what's going on here because I spent my Friday all day trading meme stocks there was no action in the market at all so I I decided to trade meme stocks and there was a lot of money to be made in trading meme stocks on intraday basis, aka day trading, swing trading, whatever you want to call it. Let's start with AMC. I issued this tweet on Friday indicating the support line and the expectations for a bounce here. And I did indeed buy AMC with options at the support line. And here it is. We saw a pop higher of about 4%. Now 4% is good, but when we talk about options, the gains doubled in less than half an hour. This is an excellent trade on Friday. AMC bouncing higher. And now we have to look at 42 and a half as the soft support for now. And it should hold at least on Monday. If 42 and a half is violated, then we go back at looking at 32 for the last support line. And of course, the resistance remains the one I'm eyeing at 52. Here's the others. We're talking about SPRT, BBIG, and KPLT. And I noticed the trend here where traders are trading these names on intra -bay, intraday basis. Excuse me. What does that mean? It means they buy BBIG for a little while, causing a pop. They're buying options, of course. Once the pop is finished, they dump it right away within the same day and they switch to KPLT. They pump that one when they're finished, taking profits, they switch to SPRT. It's like a horse race. You're betting on different horses 
and you're switching from horse to horse. And this is exactly what happened on Friday. As KPLT, which was leading the gains in the morning, double digits, when it started to dump, meaning profit taking, those profits switched to BBIG. And we saw the name riding higher right away. They went back and forth in this one, pumping, dumping, pumping, dumping all day. So let's talk about SPRT first support.com as we head closer to the september 17th expiration date for options in these meme stocks those stocks trading down from the top will witness short covering on the other hand stocks that exploded higher 100 200 even a thousand percent in a short amount of time you will see profit taking as we head closer to september 17th for now, when we look at SPRT, I told you the gap at 1965, but it will not happen. The stock will bounce before that. And this is exactly what happened on Friday morning. The stock was trading higher by the tune of over 6% before selling off. And those profits rotated to KPLT and other meme stocks. This is a one hour chart, by the way, and my expectations are we should see some short covering here, profit taking, that will lead us closer to the gap as I'm highlighting in the chart. This is the gap above, not the gap below. What about KPLT? I traded this one. I bought puts pretty much closer to the top and I attempted to ride the ride higher by the end of the day. There was about 30 minutes left in trading. And I was looking at the chart. This is a five minute chart, by the way. I was eyeing a pop at the end of the day but it did not work out as expected here. We saw a pop, but it was not good enough in options trading. The profits were not there. I closed this trade pretty much at the flat line. No profits at all. My expectations are if the chart is trading above the support of six bucks, it should pop higher. It should resume the rally higher. But breaking six bucks will be an ominous signal that perhaps the rally in this meme stock is coming to an end. Here is a BBIG, perhaps the weakest link here. Why? Because it has been the biggest winner. We will see profit taking as we get closer to September 17th. If anything, this is the chart to sell because you have what it appears to be a head and shoulder formation that will push the stock to trade to the downside. This is a 30 minutes chart, by the way. How do I know that I'm wrong and this is not a head and shoulder formation if the chart trades above 10 bucks at the opening on Monday? Excuse me, Tuesday. Monday is today and it's Labor Day. And lastly, this is the meme stock, the only meme stock, and it's not really a meme stock, but it's a candidate to become a meme stock. And it's the only stock that I own in this category. The ticker GDRX. This is a weekly chart. The company is called GoodRx. We have a descending line and the chart has been making lower lows. Except this time around, the chart made higher lows. This is an error, by the way, in the chart. It says higher high. It should say higher low. If this is the case, then this chart should pop higher in the event of a short squeeze to a minimum of about 23 and a half percent all the way to the sloping descending trend line i've been talking about this stock for a while now indicating that it has a bigger potential for a short squeeze than amc and the likes why do i say that because the short interest in this company is over 30%. In addition, when we look at the fundamentals for this company, yes, the stock is extremely overvalued right now, but at least this is a company that is expanding its margins dramatically when we look at the last quarter's earnings. The Wall Street betters and the like say that this is a no-go GDRX because the stock is too expensive. It's about $14, $15 billion valuation. For us to push the stock higher, we need a lot of money. We need to push Push the stock higher and invest about two to three billion dollars among the retail community to push the stock higher and elicit and initiate a short squeeze. My counter is, yet you're still holding AMC. AMC is valued above GDRX. And the short interest in AMC is about half what it is in GDRX. So if you're holding AMC for now, you're just waiting for the short squeeze, the short covering, which will never happen. And even if it happens, it's only about 15 to 18%. In GDRX, you just need a little pop, 10, 15%, a gamma squeeze combined by buying of the stock, which I did, by the way, I own the stock. This will scramble the shorts to start a short covering rally. And this time around, you got over 30% of the float shorted in this name. Anyhow, this is my pitch for the stock. Do whatever you want to do. It's my wild card. I don't own these kind of stocks, but it's a bet for a potential 
or for short squeeze. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have nothing, nothing scheduled at all, but we have some events for the reminder of the week. For example, on Wednesday, we have the beige book from the Fed. Then on Thursday, we have, per usual, the weekly jobless claims. And perhaps the most important day on Friday, we have the PPI. And for me, this is a more reliable indicator for inflation than the CP lie. Anyhow, folks, I hope you had a wonderful long weekend and you're well rested and ready for the action this week and beyond. And with that, this is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.